Why does Voltorb blow itself up all the time? Voltorb is an electric type Pokemon that looks like a Pokeball from the original 151 squad all the way back in Gen 1, and its signature move is blowing itself up right in your face. Why does it do this? How does it do this? Well, we're gonna have to answer both of these questions today separately. Let's start with the first one, the how. Well, the answer to how Voltorb blows itself up is pretty simple, and it's right there in the name of the Pokemon type type he is. Electricity. Electricity is simply the movement of electrons from one place to another. This encompasses things as simple as you shocking your finger after walking in socks on a carpet and then touching a piece of metal, and things as complicated and dynamic as national power grids. But can you use electricity, this moving of electrons, to cause explosions? Absolutely. But could an animal do it? Maybe? You see, even without socks and carpets, animals are capable of producing electricity. It's actually flowing through you right now, sending signals between all the nerves in your body telling you to do stuff, and it's by using our body's dependence on electrical signals to maintain ourselves that makes it possible for animals like the electric catfish to weaponize electricity in the wild by producing over 350 volts of electricity. They do this using a special organ called an, uh, an electric organ? Really? Come on, scientists, you can do so much better than that. This organ is highly specialized, and it has little cells called electrocytes that pump out positive sodium and potassium ions, which creates a potential energy difference. When it's time to use that electricity, they open the cells up and BAM! Fried fish for dinner. But how do we get from electric fish in the water in real life to exploding Pokeball looking thing in a video game? Well, we don't really. I think Voltorb works in a completely different way from this. Simply because the energy release requirements are far too high for these electric organs to be of much use. Voltorbs are pretty big, they're half a meter wide, which is about the size of a beach ball, which not only makes it hilarious that anybody could ever confuse them for a Pokeball that's meant to fit in your hand, but also, importantly, they are far too small to fit in enough electrocytes into their bodies to make themselves explode using electricity. These things simply take up too much space and are too heavy, so they must be creating this explosion in a totally different way. Gunpowder? No! That's cheating and that was also Tanya's idea and you're wrong! No, we can explain how Voltorbs explode easily without cheating and just saying each one is born with a stick of dynamite inside. It. And amazingly, the answer is surprisingly simple. Stomach acid. Okay, I might have to explain that one a bit because I don't want y'all walking away from this video thinking either A, that your stomachs are going to spontaneously explode, or B, that you can somehow turn your stomach into a battery. And, you know, just, just give me a second. Can I turn my stomach into a battery? Oh. No freaking way. Okay, apparently in 2017, Giovanni Traverso, a gastroenterologist and biomedical engineer at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School, was able to turn stomachs into batteries and run wireless temperature sensors in the stomachs of pigs for about a week. Hmm, I wonder if that paper will come in handy later. Well, so I guess you can turn stomachs into batteries, which actually more or less perfectly proves what I'm getting at. You see, this stomach battery thing runs off the same concept as lemon batteries that you may have made before in school. You can stick a galvanized nail over here in a lemon and a piece of copper over here in the same lemon, put a load between them and BAM! You are making electricity and you're making electricity through a chemical reaction. Two chemical reactions, point of fact. The lemon juice is what's known as an electrolyte in this context and it's reacting with the metals that are making contact with it. The lemon juice 
reduces electrons on the zinc oxide surface of the galvanized nail and removing electrons from the copper. When you connect the two metals with a wire, you're creating a circuit, and the electrons travel from the electron-rich zinc to the electron-poor copper. This might also be called a short circuit. Keep this part in mind, it's gonna become really important later. Now, electric organs are built out of repurposed nerve and muscle cells. Basically, through the convoluted process of evolution, somehow a little chemical battery was formed inside fish completely out of the stuff that was already there. Sodium, potassium, all that stuff is the same stuff your body uses to make you do stuff. Is it possible that Voltorb is using its own evolutionary adaptation to create electricity to explode, but using more powerful components? Maybe. There's a few hints in the various Pokedex entries from the game, specifically these two. The first from Stadium and the second from Crystal. Usually found in power plants, in some instances they have been seen drawing power from the trolleys of electric trains. During the study of this Pokemon, it was discovered that its components are not found in nature. The second one is interesting, mostly because it confirms that some weird stuff is going on inside of Voltorb, but the first is really telling. Voltorbs absorb electricity from electric sources. Um, why would they do this? Because they have a massive, massive, rechargeable battery inside of them instead of a stomach. You see, stomach acid is hydrochloric acid, a, a potent acid, I might add. The stomach's main job in nature is to break down food into its constituent parts for our bodies so we can absorb the nutrients. But the main job of our nerves and muscles is to send signals to our bodies and make us move and stuff, not create a giant capacitor like electric catfish have. The point is, things can become other things. That's right. I'm suggesting... <laughs> I'm <laughs> I am suggesting that Voltorb evolved its stomach into a lead acid battery like cars have. That instead of a stomach, it's got a 12 volt battery just in there. That's why it eats electricity instead of food. Get it? It, it? it all works. Just find some lead, toss it in that bad boy, and let the stomach do the re- Do the- do the- um- uh, What's that? Lead acid car batteries use sulfuric acid and not hydrochloric acid. And hydrochloric acid would react disastrously with the lead sponge and lead oxide and not let it produce a viable battery? Ah, dang it! Crap! Fart! Ah, I thought I had a viable theory, but now I have nothing! All that work! What am I supposed to do now? Give up making YouTube videos, I guess! Oh, hey! What's this? Prolonged energy harvesting for ingestible devices. All right, they turn stomachs into batteries. I could, I could kiss you. So it turns out that magnesium and copper work just fine in hydrochloric acid and they're way less bad for you than lead is. I think that checks out. Voltorbs gave up eating normal food so they could eat magnesium rocks and drain power from power lines. Um, fantastic! It uses magnesium and copper as cathodes in a hydrochloric acid solution in what used to be its stomach and that's where it gets its electric powers. But uh, how does it explode? Well, that part is actually really, really, really simple to explain. Now, let's think back to our lemon battery that we made before, which is, frankly, exactly like this, except we're using a different electrolyte, and instead of zinc, we're using magnesium. So, under ordinary use, Voltorb is probably using this electricity to power its basic functions, like moving places, thinking Voltorb thoughts, uh, you know, the usual. It can also weaponize this resource, as they can learn Thunderbolt and Thundershock just from leveling up. How does it do this? Well, it's probably got to get a little clever. You see, one big cell of acid with metals poked in it can't output a ton of power, even if it has a large energy capacity. But if you break up this big stomach sack battery into multiple smaller cells, each with their own cathodes and arrange them in series, you could dramatically up the potential power output of this system. In fact, this is how electric eels and fish do it too, though their cells are very, very tiny. This is why such a tiny little organ is capable of outputting over 300 volts though. This is how moves like Thundershock can be used, but explosions? How is that possible? By a short circuit. 
You see, in this current arrangement, all the electricity is going somewhere. It's either being turned into locomotive energy to move the Voltorb, or it's actually leaving the creature in the form of an attack. But if we shortened this circuit and connected all these things together in one big loop feeding into itself, this moving energy would have nothing to do, nothing to do, except get hot. It would be creating heat energy. And as the system gets hotter, the resistance rises in these little bionic cables because the atoms that make up that system are already vibrating pretty fast. So as the organ batteries try to output the same current with decreased conductivity, it will get even hotter and hotter. Hot enough to burn the insides of the Voltorb and burning things creates gas. Hot gas. Hot gases want to expand, but the Voltorb is solid so the gas has nowhere to go, which increases the pressure. As the heat rises and things begin to rupture, the hydrochloric acid will begin to vaporize too, building the pressure even more. The pressure inside the Voltorb will build and build and build until it can't be contained inside them anymore. The container holding this gas ruptures, sending hot gas and debris flying in all directions. In other words, Voltorb explodes. And this runaway chain reaction can happen really quickly, like I'm talking seconds. In Internal short circuits are one of the major causes of batteries exploding and it can happen in no time at all because electricity is that powerful. And keep this in mind, hand grenades have about a quarter of a megajoule of energy inside them, while motorcycle batteries have over four times that. These runaway cascading energy events can get really dangerous really quickly. At least that's my theory for how Voltorb explodes, maybe they just go around eating dynamite all day for all I know, but I really like this weaponized internal short circuit idea, now we get to the really interesting part. The why. Why are they exploding? It's ridiculous, right? In fact, I was ready to end this episode right here, throw down a bombastic, this makes no freaking sense, Game Freak and or Nintendo, but let me tell you, friend, that this, this strategy, it makes perfect sense. And when I found out why, it blew my freaking mind. When you encounter Voltorbs in the wild, they know four moves, three things that I don't really care about, and self-destruct. Now, I believe wild Pokemon AI is pretty dumb, at least in the early games, they would just pick a move at random and that's what they would do. So you essentially had a 25% chance of having your Pokemon blown to smithereens when you encountered one of these things. Why do they do this? No animal in our world or the next blows themselves up completely while under threat. We have possums that play dead, lots of animals that play dead actually, but nothing that blows themselves up. Or that's what I thought until I discovered the pea aphid. Originating in Southeast Asia, pea aphids when under threat will explode their freaking heads or split open their own bodies as a defense mechanism, which you may be thinking like I did, defense? Against what? What? are you defending against if you're dead? And that is a good question and is probably the first thing that comes to your mind if you're a highly individualistic species like humans are. But aphids use their tiny brains to think just a little bit smarter. You see, when pea aphids explode, they send poison flying everywhere. It gets all over whatever was attacking them, often ladybugs or some species of ants, poison that either kills the predator outright or thoroughly ruins their appetite. And you know what dead predators don't do? Hunt and eat your friends. Somehow, throughout the course of evolution, aphids figured out that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or in this case, the evolutionary fitness of the many outweighs mine. Therefore, I'm gonna do what I can to make sure our general colony is more safe. An aphid is, um, let me just look at it. It's cute, but it's helpless. One that's under attack is probably dead anyway. But by discouraging predators, or even taking some of them off the board entirely, they make sure that their entire family survives. And tell me that this behavior doesn't map perfectly onto Voltorbs. For one, you encounter them in a pretty out of the way spot and there's a bunch of them there. Realistically, I mean like you realistically, if you were walking through a building and some beach ball looking thing rolled in front of you and you're like, Geo dude, attack! That thing knows it's probably going to die. I mean, faint, but 
we know what faint means in Pokemon. It's just like going to that little happy farm in the countryside if you don't have a trainer to take you to a Poke Center. So you're gonna die. So uh, what do you do? Act like Nidorans and cower in fear and await your demise? No, you blow yourself up like a freaking hand grenade. Tell me, you really, like you as a person, if you saw a sentient creature blow itself up, spraying hot organs and hydrochloric acid vapor and fluids all over the place, obliterating your Pokemon and probably causing you some degree of serious injury, would you go further into that building or would you, like me, do everything in your power for the rest of your life to avoid anything even vaguely ball-shaped and pray, pray you never come across one ever again? The second one, I bet. That's a smart move. So Voltorbs evolved to have battery cells instead of stomachs, eat magnesium, and recharge their reserves by draining electricity and blow themselves to smithereens, sending polka shrapnel and hot stomach acid flying all over the room, all because somehow all of them learned the lesson that took Spock like 30 years to teach Captain Kirk. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. Or the one. Sincerely, Austin. Oh boy, that was a fun episode. I had a ton of fun researching that one and it was all possible due to my patrons at patreon.com and especially these ones that I have to give a personal shout out to like Juan Santa Maria, Mad Lad 616, Miss Kendra, Ronald Coleman, Alan Hagers, Edit AMTP, Nicholas Blinger, Marissa Resnick, Nick Patterson, and Loretta Mazurf. I will see you next time, guys. Have a good one and don't get yourself blown up by Voltorbs.